Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Come on, let's go. You guys ready to have a great day today? Listen, if we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Jason. I'm the worship pastor here at the chapel. Really excited to be sharing God's word with you this weekend. Last weekend, Pastor Q started us on this brand new series. It was absolutely incredible. It's all about building a spiritual beach body. Because it's summer, y'all. It's summer. We got to get ready for the beach. Why? Because when we go to the beach, we want to be confident, don't we? We want to be able to participate in beachy things, things like swimming in the ocean, things like running on the sand, which is a lot harder than it looks, playing football, playing volleyball. We want to be ready so that we can be confident and we can be effective. The same thing is true for a spiritual beach body because God has a season for us that we're about to go into and we have an opportunity to prepare for that season so that when we get there, we can be effective and confident. Amen? But what that means is we have got to shed some of the weight, the weight of things that we've picked up over the years, the weight of things that holds us back, weighs us down, keeps us from being everything that God created us to be. we got to shed things like anger. We have to shed things like insecurity. We have to shed things like habits and behaviors. we got to get rid of those stuff so that we can run the way God created us to run. Amen? So I'm well aware that some of you may not know what a beach body is. And for the visual learners in the room, I brought something to help. So let's take a look. <laughs> Come on. Look at that guy right there. Come on. Y'all didn't think I had it in me. But I do. Pastor Q last week showed a very similar picture. Let's take a look at that one. Yes. Yeah, that's a handsome fellow right there, all right? But I don't know if you noticed it, but there is one major, major difference between my picture and Pastor Q's picture. Because Pastor Q's picture is fake. It's photoshopped, forgery, not real. Mine is, case closed, moving on. If you've got your Bibles with you or your Bible app, if you could open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 19. And this is what it says. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. What we can see as we read this amazing scripture is that we are both a spiritual being and a physical being. We're both, okay? And because we have a spiritual, because we have a physical purpose, it's important for us to stay physically healthy, and because we have a spiritual purpose, it's important for us to stay spiritually healthy. When we become believers and followers, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God places his spirit inside of us. And so it's incredibly important for us to shed the weight of some of these things so that we can be spiritually healthy and we can do the things that we were created to do. So today what we're going to talk about is we are going to talk about shedding the weight of negativity. That's right, people. Negativity's got to go. We're going to learn how to shed the weight of negativity because negativity is the emotional equivalent of a jelly donut. How many of you tried dieting before? Okay, yep. About day five of my diet, jelly donuts become Satan. They're just staring you down, begging you to eat them. But if you think about this, if you just slam jelly donuts day after day after day, you are going to pack on a significant amount of physical weight. With negativity, if that's the only thing that we're feeding on day in and day out, we are going to be packing on a significant amount of emotional weight. Okay. Now listen, there are three things that we get negative with, and here they are. We get negative with situations, we get negative with other people, we get negative with ourselves. If you're taking, this, if you're taking notes, I want you to, to write this down. Negativity is the enemy of faith. They are in direct opposition with each other 100% of the time. Because negativity would look at these three categories, categories and say this. 
No, it can't. No, they can't. No, I can't. But faith tells us a different story. Faith would look at those categories and say, yes, it can. Yes, they can. Yes, I can. So negativity and faith, direct opposition with each other 100% of the time. So let's take a look at uh, how we get negative with situations. Uh, Sometimes we forecast failure. We stand on the great precipice of life. Look it up. It's a great word. The precipice of life. And we see thousands of like unending possibilities and all of the amazing things that could be possible. And we drink it all in and we breathe it all in and we look into this beautiful future and we say, I'm going to fail. We forecast failure. We say things like, you know what? Things will never change. It'll never work. With all of the amazing possibilities of what God could do through us, sometimes you and I, we look at the future and say, you know what? I know what's up ahead, and it's failure. One of the other things that we do when we get negative with our situations is we say things like, nothing good ever happens to me. I never win anything. I never get the promotion. I never get the girl, and I always get picked last for kickball. Then the last category, somebody up there doesn't like me. For some of us in the room and for some of us watching online, some of us really believe that God is out to get us. That God is out to make our lives incredibly difficult. You feel opposed by him. This is how we tend to get negative with our situations. We also get negative with other people. Here's some of the ways that we do that. A lot of times we pass judgment. Somebody will do something that we don't like, and we will sit back and pass judgment on them. Like when somebody brings 15 items into the 10 items or less aisle at the grocery store, you know what you call that person? A jerk. Because that's what they are. Get out of my lane. We pass judgment. And sometimes we make comparisons. A lot of times we'll find ourselves putting others down to try and boost our self-esteem. Like when you get a little bit happy that your cousin Jackie's putting on a lot of weight because it makes you feel thin. Sometimes we enjoy the, the misfortune of others. Like when the guy who got the job that you wanted gets fired and you're like, ha, 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 yeah, baby, you deserve it. Uh Uh-huh, that was my job, you took it. Enjoy your life. We celebrate the failure of others. And probably the most common one is we gossip. We love to talk about other people, especially when they're in trouble. Like when you find out your neighbors are getting a divorce because one of them has a huge gambling debt that the other one didn't know about. And we just can't wait to talk about it. These are ways that we get negative with other people. We also get negative with ourselves, And sometimes maybe you felt some of these things. Where you think that you're inadequate. And you'll hear hear yourself say things like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Maybe you feel inferior. Where you would say, I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't have enough talent. I don't have what it takes. Maybe insecurity is your thing where you would say, I'm too broken to be useful. Still others might think that it's intimidation. Maybe that's the negativity that we're putting on ourselves. When you see somebody who's so good at something and you're so not good at it yet, and you say, I shouldn't even try. Those were the words that a 12-year-old me said quite often. I shouldn't even try. I grew up in a musical family. My dad had a couple number one hits on the Christian radio circuit in the 1980s, everybody. Come on. We love the 80s. But he traveled around and he did big shows and conferences and festivals. He he went all across the world. He was an accomplished singer and songwriter. He played keyboard. He played bass. He played guitar. So imagine, if you will, what it would have been like for a 12-year-old me to start to have this inkling from God that, hey, I think maybe I should do something with music. And here I am looking at everything that I'm not and looking at my dad and seeing all of his success 
and all of his talent. And I started to believe a lie about myself. If he was so good at it, I shouldn't even try. Now, what's amazing about the faithfulness of God is he still kept me on the path that he called me to. I mean, part of my job as worship pastor here is kind of musical. He was so faithful to bring me to where I am, but it took longer. And it was a lot harder road because I had started to believe a lie that I shouldn't try. And because of that, I started picking up all these weights of negativity. And it slowed me down. And it made the road more difficult. I was seeing myself through the eyes of negativity saying, I can't. And God was seeing me through the eyes of faith saying, you have to. And he's so faithful, so faithful to bring us from where we are right now to where he's calling us to be. Because what I know is true about every person in this room is you are called to a specific thing. You have gifts and talents and abilities that God wants to draw out of you and use and to move his kingdom forward. The call that God has on your life has nothing to do with somebody else's talent and ability. It has everything to do with God's ability to get you there. So, listen, I'm telling you right now, it slowed me down. You know that I, I fought it for so long. I didn't want to sing in front of anybody. I didn't want to even try to play the guitar. I would try to find moments. I would sneak around, and I would grab the guitar and run to my room and try to figure out a couple things. And then when somebody came in, I would, I would quickly go put it back because I didn't want to be compared. I was buying into a lie. So as we move forward today, I think a good definition for all of us to work with about negativity is this. Negativity is our opinion void of God's truth. I want you to write that down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, I would like for you to take notes. (laughs) Negativity is our opinion void of God's truth. Because what happens when we look at situations and we look at other people and we look at ourselves without the light of God's truth, all of a sudden, all we have to work with is our own flawed and limited understanding. And when we look at situations and other people and ourselves with our own flawed and limited understanding, we start to believe things that aren't true. And we pick up weights of negativity left and right. Until it weighs us down and it starts to keep us from being who God created us to be. But what I love about God's word is he is always so faithful to give us answers. Amen. His word is so full of truth that's relevant for us today. That's going to make a difference in our lives today. And one of those scriptures is this. 2 Corinthians 10.5. This is what it says. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Man, that's good. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. What we can quickly see in this verse is there is a battle going on. There is a battle between the knowledge of God, which is truth, and every argument and lofty opinion that raises itself up against the truth. There's a battle going on. But how battles work is if only one side shows up, that's generally the side that wins. For so much of my life, and maybe for yours, negativity was the only side showing up to the battle. And because it was the only side showing up to the battle, it was getting in unchallenged, unchecked, It was running rampant in our hearts and our minds, and it was affecting our action. The knowledge of God is his truth. But I wasn't doing a very good job hiding his truth in my heart. I didn't know it, and so I couldn't fight any of the lies that I was saying about myself. They were just getting in unchallenged and unchecked. But what's great about the scripture is this verse very clearly identifies the issue and then very quickly gives us a solution. So here is the spiritual workout tip. Get ready to write it down. The spiritual workout tip is this. Take every thought captive. 
Take every thought captive. That's the spiritual workout tip for this week. Take every thought captive. Well, how do you do that, Pastor Jason? Well, I will tell you. When somebody cuts you off in traffic and you say, you're an idiot. That is not taking every thought captive. It's the opposite. But what is, is this. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. You are such a... Mm, you catch it. You capture it. You take it captive. And you bring it in. And what are you supposed to make that obedient to? Christ. And so you would stop yourself and you would gather that in and you would capture that thought and you would measure it against the truth of God's word. Because I actually don't know if that person's an idiot, but I do know, according to God's word, that that person is one of his creations. <sighs> Fine. <laughs> if you're married, say, oh yeah. oh yeah. There we go. Yeah. Glad you're excited to be married. <laughs> Me too. But it does come with its challenges, doesn't it? <laughs> Again, oh yeah. <laughs> That's great. When you've known your spouse for a long, long time, you know exactly the words and phrases to use to send them over the edge. In any conversation, at any moment, you've got this little red button where you can push it and things are going to go nuclear. And so let's say you're arguing a little bit. You're doing a little bit of light sparring. Ooh, jab in the middle. Oh, oh, you got one? Let's go. You're dancing around. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just zings you. And you're like, ha, 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 have you met my little red button? <laughs> this is the moment. This is the moment where you have an opportunity to enact the truth of God's word. This is a moment where you can take every thought captive. This is a moment where you can raise up the knowledge of God that fights against every argument and lofty opinion that raises itself up against the truth. Because what the Bible says about my spouse, my wife, is that I'm supposed to love her like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Shoot! Because I really wanted to push the button, but now I can't. Because God's truth supersedes the lies that I believe. A lot of times, only one side is showing up to the battle. But the scripture says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Put some truth on the battlefield and let's see what God can do. Because there is nothing more powerful than the truth of God's word. Nothing. The lies of the enemy cannot stand against his word. Put both teams on the field. Let's see what happens. Give yourself a chance. So we have a workout that we've been encouraging every service to do. Really want to encourage you to do this. And here's a spiritual, spiritual workout for the week. I want you, because I'm going to do it too, I want you to make a lies and truth list. I want you to make a lies and truth list. And the lies and truth list is a really easy concept to understand, but it's a little bit difficult to do. And I know some of you are out there right now saying, Pastor Jason, I love you. I ain't making no list. I got stuff to do. You're going to wish that you had. Let me encourage you. Carve some time out for this. Here's the easy idea. You learn the lie. That's the first thing that you do. And then you write down all of the lies that you believe about yourself on the left side of the paper. Some of you it will be two or three. Some of you will be half a page. Some of you will be 45 pages. That's okay. Write them all down. You learn the lie and you write it down in one category. And then you identify the truth in God's word that defeats that lie. And you write it down right next to the lie. And you put this list in a place where you can see it each and every day. And you make a commitment to speak the truth of God's word into your heart and into your life every day. It's easy to understand, but it's a little bit harder to do. Let me tell you why. There's a reason it says, learn the lie. Because not all of us know what the lie is. Because it's become so normal 
and so natural that we no longer notice. And so you have to make this a spiritual search party. You have to carve out some time in your week to sit down and get alone with God and ask the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, show me the things that I believe about myself that are not in your word. Show me the things that aren't lining up, and he will be so faithful to show you. But there are some of us where this is deeply, deeply ingrained, and you're actually going to need help. You're going to need someone to come alongside you and look at your life and help you discover the lies that you're believing about yourself. Talk to your pastors. Talk to your mentor. Talk to a counselor. Make time to have someone come alongside you and say, yep, that's the narrative that you're using. Those are the words that you're using. That's the way that you're thinking. Those are the statements that you're saying over yourself, but they're not what God says about you. And you write them all down. And maybe you're sitting there saying, you know, I don't know that I want to have a list where I see it every day, where I see all of the lies that I believe. Yeah, you're going to want to. Because it's on purpose. Because if you don't learn what lies that you are susceptible to, you'll never recognize them. And they'll just keep coming in unchecked, unchallenged. But if you can learn the lie then you can recognize it. And if you can recognize the lie, then you can capture it. Like God's word says, take every thought captive. And if you can capture it, then you can categorize it. You can lift it up against God's truth and say, no, you don't belong in my life. You can go. But it starts with doing the hard work of learning the lies that you believe. Because, listen, it is wise to know where we are weak. So that you can be ready for it, like a tiger, ready to pounce. You're like, come on, I know the three lies that I believe. Bring it on, life, let's go. You're just waiting. You're waiting because you know what they are. So that you can grab them around the neck and you can show them God's word and you can say, you no longer have a place in my life. Learn it to recognize it. Recognize it to capture it. Capture it to categorize it and then chuck it. And then once we know the specific lie that we've been believing, then we can write down the specific truth in God's word that defeats the lie. For some of us in here, one of the lies that would be in that category is, you know what? Things will never change. How many of you would be honest and raise your hand and say, I've said that in my life. Things will never change. This will never get any better. Yeah, me too. But maybe what needs to go in the truth category is one of our favorite verses. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he can turn it like a river. Because what that says is my God can change a situation. My God can change an individual. My God can change a circumstance. You put that truth on the battlefield to fight against the lie that says things will never change. When that thing raises its ugly head, you point it to the truth of Scripture. Because the word of God is living and powerful and active. And it will change your life when you apply it. Put truth on the battlefield. Some of us would have in the lie category, you know what? I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. An opportunity comes your way and what do you say? I can't do it. You have a chance to do something and you say, I can't do it. You're trying to plan and dream and have a vision for your life and immediately you say, by default, I can't do it. Well, maybe in the truth category, you need to have the verse that says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Put that truth on the battlefield and let's see what God can do. And then you speak that truth every day over yourself. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord, and he can turn it like a river. You declare this truth over and over and over in your life. Why? Because there's life and death in the power of the tongue. What you say about your life matters. So when you speak truth, you give life to truth. Why does that matter? Why do I have to speak it? Well, if you're like me, this negativity and these lies that I believe about myself, they didn't get there overnight. They got there hour by hour, over weeks, months, and years, and even decades. And what you do when you build a default into your life, like there's a situation that happens and you have a natural response, it's because a neural pathway has been burned in your brain. 
a deep groove that says, when this happens, this is how you respond. It got there over time. So if you're going to change it, it's going to take time. You have to build a new neural pathway. You have to speak things that have power over your life over and over again every day so that you can get into a new groove. If you want to bypass what took years to make, then you have to spend some time bypassing it. Declare the truth over your life every day. Put both teams on the field. Give yourself a chance. Something that Pastor Q said last week, it was so good, and I'm going to mention it again for this week. He talked about when when people want to uh, get fit and they want to lose some weight, sometimes people will start exercising. They'll jog, they'll get on a bike, they'll start lifting weights, they'll do these things, but they won't change their diet. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can run for four miles, but if you go home and eat four pizzas, it's not going to matter. In fact, it'll probably get worse. That is, by the way, how big guys define pizza. It's not by the slice. It's definitely by the box, okay? (laughs) You have to change what you consume if you want to change what you produce. We have to start making healthy diet decisions because whatever you feed will grow. Can you write that down in your notes? Whatever you feed will grow. If you feed unhealthiness, it'll grow. If you feed truth, it'll grow. The Bible is chock full of promises for you and me. It's full of of, of things that are declared that are how you're wired and how you were created and the way that you were created to live. It's full of these things. But there's one scripture in particular that is really, really important for us today as we talk about changing the way that we think. And it's Philippians 4, 8. And this is what it says. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. These are the things that you've got to be thinking about every day, day in and day out. Not I can't, not it won't change, no they won't change. Get rid of that narrative, add this narrative that says, yeah, I'm going to think about what's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely. What is true? That you're valued by God. Look at this list. What's honorable? God will never leave me. What's something just that you can start to think about? That my sin is paid for. You know what truth you can start to feed? You can feed something pure, that God loves me unconditionally. Or something lovely, that God's creation is all around me. Or something commendable, that God's desire is to bless my life. Something excellent, God has given me talents and abilities. And something worthy of our praise is that we have been forgiven. Put that truth on the battlefield. Lies of the enemy cannot stand against things like this. Because this is powerful and it's true and it's important for how we live our life. If you've been coming to the chapel for any length of time, you've probably heard us talk about something called growth track. We talk about it a lot and there's a reason why. Because Growth Track is one of the best places for you to hear these things. To hear how you were created. To hear what God says is true about you. To hear how you were wired to move his kingdom forward. Every Sunday, Building B across the way, 1015. I want to encourage all of you to make it a point to go through all four sessions. Because this is what you're going to find out. And this is what you need to be speaking over your life day in and day out. Because sometimes, you and I... People watching online, we may have the tendency to say, I'm worthless. But we can feed the truth that fights that lie and says something that's true. I am valued by God. Some of us feel very alone and we say things like, I'm so alone. But if we will think every day about something honorable, we'll know that God will never leave me or forsake me. Some of us would say, my sin is too great, Pastor Jason. My sin is too great. I would encourage you to look at something that's just and the fact that your sin is paid for. No one loves me. (laughs) No, that's not what's pure. What's pure is God loves me unconditionally. I've actually said the next statement often uh, and recently this week. This world is an ugly place. It's an ugly place. 
But I can fight that with the truth of something that's lovely, and that's the fact that God has built this incredible creation and given to us. Nothing good ever happens to me. Well, you and I, we can't say that anymore because we're going to make this lies and truth list. And one of the things that's going to be on it is something commendable that we say every day. And that's the fact that God's desire is to bless my life. I have nothing to offer. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because something excellent would say this. You have gifts and talents and abilities that you can use to move God's kingdom forward. That's what's true. This is the kicker. Because some of us in this room have said this, will say this, continue to say this. Some of us would say, God will never really accept me. God will never really accept me. But you and I have the opportunity to feed something that we want to grow. We can feed a truth and we can think every day of something that is worthy of our praise and our admiration and our worship. And that's the fact that you and I are forgiven. We have the chance to put the knowledge of God and his truth up against every argument and lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And because we put both teams on the battlefield, we'll have a chance to take every thought captive and categorize it as either true or false. And we can chuck it and live the life that God created for us because we have shed the weight of negativity. Today we have an incredible opportunity to receive communion together. There are tables all across the front. There's a few in the back and there are some up in the balcony. The worship team is going to come out and they're going to play. And we're going to worship in a minute. But I want you to realize something. Communion is something that should be a part of a steady diet for a believer and a follower. Not because it's actual food and drink, but because of what it symbolizes. Because when you walk to these tables, you're feeding a truth. And that is the fact that this life is not about me and my comfort. This life is about him and his kingdom. That's right. right. When you take a piece of bread that represents the broken body of Jesus Christ, you start to realize, oh my goodness, I've been bought with a high price. I am not my own. You're feeding a truth. When you take that bread and you dip it into the juice, because the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for all of us for the forgiveness of our sins. You're feeding the truth that he loves you. We have to have these things in our lives because we tend to drift away from truth. We have to have things like a lies and truth list somewhere on our mirror next to our bed in our car where we're going to see it every day where we speak out the truth of who God created us to be. We need to have things like communion that feed the truth. Feeds the truth of his sacrifice. Feeds the truth of his love. Feeds the truth that he's coming back for us. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember the truth. Anchor yourself to the truth. So when you're ready, take your time. Search your heart. When you come to the table, realize that you are feeding important truths that are going to be important for you to fight the lies so that you can shed the weight of negativity. Let's feed the truth that he died for us. Let's feed the truth that he loves us. Let's feed the truth that he's coming back for us. Amen. Love you guys.